Uh, April 11, 2017. Uh, we're with Alice Wolfson and it's Ann Gallivan and Norma Lesser. And we're a project of the Institute for Policy Studies Lessons of the 60s. Um, Alice. Uh, you came to Washington as a young woman. Uh, how did you become involved in the women's movement? I moved to Washington in the summer of 1969. Um, I had been already in the women's movement in New York City, where, where I had been living. I'd been in several consciousness raising groups. I had been to Cuba. I was. I had been in the anti-war movement. So I had. I had. I came as an activist, and moved into the the same building that Marilyn Webb lived in, and. We became friends, I became, and I think through her, I got into the women's movement here and um, continued in it until I left in 77. Um, you, um, you were basically involved, you had very different interests, but yet you, women's health became one of your primary interests. Um, talk about your involvement with women's health issues, especially uh, birth control pills. Okay, um, I was at that time in my life an audiologist and I had gotten a master's in, of science at Stanford University at that time. It was a part of the medical school, so I kind of had a medical background. Then I was married to a doctor whom I had met in New York who was also in the Medical Committee for Human Rights and, and uh, so I was kind of just interested in health and I also felt like the way the, the medical system was organized then, it felt like a, a, a microcosm of the larger society. All the doctors were white men, the nurses who were lower down were all women, um, the, the LPNs were women. It just felt like a very manageable thing. Also, it was easier, I, for me, easier to measure your success. And, and abortion was a big issue, if you remember in, in the early women's movement, abortion was a really big issue. So every women's group did something around abortion. The, the pill happened kind of accidentally. Uh, women's Liberation, DC Women's Liberation was divided up into collectives and I was in a collective called the Daughters of Lilith and um, we were sitting around just like we are here today and Somebody said, did you hear about the hearings that are going to be on the birth control pill? And all of us had taken the pill. None of us were uh, badly affected by side effects, but everyone had a side effect. No doctor had ever told us about side effects. So we just went, just a few of us went, and we were just appalled at, at what was going on. Again, a whole panel of white male senators and one after another speaker men not a single woman not not a, a single person who had taken the pill and had a bad side effect not a single woman researcher it was as if women didn't exist and we were talking about the birth control pill that women were taking and there were some horrifying statistics at that time people didn't yet know whether it was going to be safe in the long run there were hidden studies about uh, people, women dying from thromboembolic disorders and heart attacks, strokes. Young women were having strokes, not in vast numbers, but enough so that you would want to know and make the choice. And that's what happened is we started, we just, because we were bold in those days and we would do anything, we just stood up and started asking questions. And the senators were just appalled. Finally, they closed the hearings. <laughs> and after that we organized. It, w it was not organized at first, but it got so much publicity and it became so apparent that there should be a warning on the birth control pill that women could at least make a choice. And, and basically I think we did succeed in getting the first patient package insert on a prescription drug in the United States. Talk about abortion, the abortion issues at that time? Well, the abortion issues were very tied in with the pill thing because abortion was not legal. Um, the Guttmacher Institute had all sorts of studies showing that the safest method of birth control was going to be a barrier method followed by safe, legal 
abortion. So it was very tied together, and when the pill came, it was like, okay, maybe you didn't need abortion, but it happened, it happened kind of in, at the same time that abortion was legalized, that the pill be, began to be really widely used mm -hmm. and was very welcomed. But, and well, that's why everybody had taken it. It was welcomed. We wanted it. To be able to have sex without being afraid of getting pregnant was great. But there were a lot of side effects. Mm -hmm. If you recall, uh, this is, I'm just remembering now, there was a doctor named Hugh Davies who had come out with the Dalcon Shield, which at the time we thought was going to be instead of the pill, little knowing that it was marketed with full, full understanding that women could get infected. So there was, it, it put, it put the drug company out of business and there was huge amounts of settlements and um, but it, it was like women's health issues abortion the pill um, the uh, DES they, they were kind of all all together I don't think we in in uh, Washington worked on DES but when I got to San Francisco that was one of the issues that people were working on DES daughters uh, talk about your experience with um, international conferences that happened in the early 70s and uh, why they were set up and okay. well, what they were and where you went. And okay, well, going back to the idea of, our, of us having collectives, um, I was also in the anti-imperialist, DC anti-women's anti anti-imperialist group. Right. Uh, there was another collective called the Women's Anti-Imperialist Group, mm -hmm. and like with all of our our work, meetings, 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 and <laughs> <laughs> Women's Strike for Peace uh, was having a conference, an international women's conference. Actually, yes, that's exactly what happened. Um, they were organizing a conference in, t in Toronto, and I was selected by our anti-imperialist group to go to Budapest where the conference was um, and I, I guess I was paid for because I don't remember how we had the money but I, I <laughs> went to them um, and I met with Vietnamese women who were going to come to Toronto to this conference um, and we then came back to the United States and we started working and we must have worked on that conference for a year? Close to a year. Yeah, yeah. close to a year. Um, and I went to Toronto. I guess I was on the Sturry Committee, although I have to say my memory isn't that clear about it. But I went to Toronto five months pregnant. And the, the meetings in Toronto were endless. We'd make decisions, and the next day they'd be completely <laughs> eradicated. It, it was so frustrating that I, I remember lying on the floor as these some with this big belly as these meetings were going on and and finally I left I, I just said this can't be good for me I'm pregnant I remember people saying you're leaving I said, yes I'm leaving so um, but but the the whole purpose of it was part, the the war was still going on the Vietnam War and um, we felt like there was no women's voice and that's true. The anti, the anti draft movement was all male, so that's what this conference was for, was about. It, and it was started. It, I think it, the idea was first generated by Women's Strike for Peace, but we did not like working with them. We were much more left than they were, and so we decided to have our own conference. And I don't remember now whether it was before or after the Women's Strike for Peace conference, but it was a, around the same time. But our organizing was separate, and it was endless. <laughs> just went on and on and on. And I just can't, I just remember, I can't even remember what the issues were, really. All I remember is some of the women coming in the next morning and saying, no, that didn't pass. We can't do that. So wherever they went at night, it got, and it was just awful. <laughs> I guess I don't even remember. I remember we put out a long report. I still have that report, I think. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, there were two. 
because the gay women put out their own separate report mm -hmm. from the, the general conference. There, that was a, the splits were amazing. Um, the, the gay straight split was continued up there in Toronto, although it was, hadn't hit as, as big here yet in, in D.C., but it was big in Toronto. And there, were, there was a group of gay women, I'm sure they had a name, a collective name, but I don't remember what it was, who, who wanted to tell the Vietnamese women that it was because they weren't gay that the war was going on. It was those kinds of fights that were happening. <laughs> So, kind of ridiculous. And you eventually went to Budapest? No, I went to Budapest first. Oh, okay. The, the, the uh, conference happened after. The, the purpose of going to Budapest was um, to organize. And in fact, Off Our Backs did a whole story on that meeting. I think I might still have that issue. Uh, I was going to mention, from the Vietnamese point of view, that conference was part of their generally successful um, um, thrust to win the hearts and minds of American people. Sure, yeah. Um, they thought and the Vietnamese important. excelled at sort of communicating with the people, the American people, um, while negotiating with the government for a peace agreement. So, I mean, that was part of their strategy to introduce American women, Canadian women, to these Vietnamese women who'd gone through the bombings and everything yeah. else. Yeah, yeah. Who walked, I, I remember hearing that one of the, some of the women from Laos walked three days to get to the place where they could be, they could get a plane. Yes. Was, they were, they were charming. Yes. They were really, really charming. Um, so it was really strange, all of this infighting was going on. Of people who should be on the same side. That's what's so uh, unfortunate about it. I just had a very similar experience uh, with this movie, um, She's Beautiful When She's Angry, which, which was just produced uh, or last year. Yeah. Um, and the director had gotten somebody from the San Francisco Chronicle to do a story on it. Well, what went on about where the meeting should happen where the reporter was going to interview the women. It was crazy. And it should be here. No, it should be here. It should be in Berkeley because this happened in Berkeley. And no, it should be here. And I, I didn't participate it, except to write to Mary. I wrote to Mary and I said, I'm not engaging in any of this, but obviously it should be at the women's building. Even if that didn't exist back then, it's, it's a logical place. And she said, it's crazy. I said, welcome to the women's movement. <laughs> back, back, back to D.C. Um, there was, um, the D.C. women organized a, uh, a, a group called the Magic Quilt. Yes. And it lasted for a few years. Could you talk about your role in it and what it was? Magic Quilt was the, our sort of governing body. We didn't want anything to do that had any hint of, of patriarchy or male, and so we called it Magic Quilt. Um, but it was kind of the governing body, again, endless meetings. Um, and it was, kind of, it was where all of the different collectives came together to give their reports, um, to decide on actions. Uh, it's where we had all the literature. It's where we had the mimeograph machine. Um, and I guess it's where we made decisions, although I can't say I can... I don't remember most of them, the decisions that were made. Describe it. Describe where it was and, and what it... I don't... I, I only remember it being a, an empty office on Biltmore Street. I don't know if it yeah, existed it before that. Yeah. Um, did it meet once a week, probably? Mm -hmm. Well, there were different different groups sort of reported in there. That's right. I mean, I was in one of the groups that we were forming a rape crisis center. Right. And we would meet there to you know figure out how to do that, and that seemed to be there was always somebody coming or going. Yeah, but I think that there were big meetings. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. There um, were lots where of everybody meetings. would lots of meetings where everybody would kind of um, check in and we're doing this, we're doing that. We had a lot of projects going. Uh, DC Women's Liberation, which was the umbrella, and Magic Quilt was. But, like I said, the governing body, insofar as anything was governed. 
Could you talk about what the witches are and who they were? Um, and yes. <laughs> you, it's really, when you start to put it together, you have to understand, we were meeting every single day, I think, practically every day. So we had a group called Women's International Terrorist Conspiracy from Hell. Which? Uh, which. And we, basically it was a guerrilla theater group. Um, we burned, um, I remember us burning in, in effigy something at the Capitol building. Jan remembers us burning something in effigy at Garfunkel's makeup department. That one I don't remember. Um, but the one I do remember is the population control meeting where we, we it was a big meeting uh, and we were there with our witches. We always had our, we had our, our dress clothes where we wore like normal clothes and we'd have our witches hats in the bag and at a certain point we got, somebody gave a signal and we all got up, we put on our witches hats, we ran to the stage, we took the microphone away from whoever the presenters were and we did a skit. And although I can't remember the skit, the refrain has stuck with me all these years. Um, you think you can cure all the world's ills by making poor women take your unhealthy pills and then we'd throw the, these aspirin out into the audience. So, we, we, were, we were really fearless. This must have been about 1970? Yes, mm -hmm. I would say it was 1970. Yeah, I, I kind of judge from when I was pregnant and when I wasn't pregnant. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I can kind of figure out the time that things happened. So looking back, like, um, I'm, not, I'm sure that Code Pink women don't know about this history. So, you know, that they, that Code Pink is doing similar stuff that we are, they're fearless mm -hmm. and they've been doing it for the last 10 years or so. And they terrified Henry Kissinger yeah. about a year ago in a hearing. They got close to him and there's a photo of him looking terrified because huh. this young woman has her fist out. So we are the uh, mothers <laughs> of Code Pink. Okay, yeah. So. Uh, um, no, I, I've, I also think that, that the activism that, that we had as women back then was also um, imitated by the uh, AIDS activists. I think that they took a lot of, from, from what we did. Mm -hmm. Yes. The quilts. You, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's one. But also, the, the back kind up, of act up was the group. Yes. Yeah, act yeah. up was the group that right. did stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. 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 And they were very successful. Yes, they were very the successful. But I, I always felt that what they did, that they always said it was the, the first such thing, but I never thought it was. I thought we were. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, do you want to talk about the pill hearings? Well, I just as a segue, we didn't talk about it earlier. You led a group that had, we had our own pill hearings. Oh, right. And it was really um, very, very strong and effective. We had mass, lots of media. Um, you and we, I don't I think, know. yes, uh, Barbara Seaman and I, we organized our own pill hearings because we wanted a woman, thanks for remembering mm -hmm. that, um, we wanted a woman's led pill hearing. Um, and we had a lot of scientists. We sent out questionnaires to um, every women's health group and feminist women's health centers. So we had long questionnaires and we compiled them. We had speakers. It was a whole day hearing. And the minutes from that actually, I think, were incorporated into the congressional record. I, I was told that. And where did you hold it? And I don't remember where we it held was. It was um, not at All Souls, uh, um, the one on 16th Street, um, that other progressive church up 16th Street, oh. uh, 16th and Park. Um, just uh, <laughs> Father <laughs> Went was there. Father Went oh, was yeah. St. Stephen's. St. Stephen's. St. Stephen's, right. Yeah. And um, WPFW um, recorded it and broadcast uh, it live. And I don't remember that. Yeah, yeah. it was a very yeah. big deal. Yeah, very I remember working deal. on it. I, yeah. yeah. Do you have anything to say? Oh, well, I wanted to uh, get back to uh, um, 
we, all the activities that the women's movement did. I also want to talk a little bit about the spirit of the time in Washington. You moved here in 1969 and became immediately active in women's yeah. health issues. But what other things were you and your husband and husband Phil doing, and what was it like to live in that collective house with all those other leftists? And I mean, you, <laughs> what was the mood when you came here? Um, the mood was, it was vibrant. It was so alive, and, and so many things were happening. Um, I hated the communes. I <laughs> never wanted to move into a commune. <laughs> And the one says, the one with Phil and Jan was better, but the one with, with, with Judy, Tim, and Marlene was very difficult. Two kids, Judy, Tim, and Marlene, Tim being gay and having his first heterosexual relationship, Marlene becoming gay, <laughs> me and Phil, the, hetero, the heterosexual couple, Phil, I did, the white male oppressor, which he was, but that, <laughs> that was Uh, and endless, endless, endless house meetings, madly crocheting, everybody crocheting. <laughs> I, I, would, I really think that the whole idea behind it was we thought that living in these communes, that, that was going to be part of the revolution, that everybody didn't need their own washing machine or their own dryer, and, and, uh, and that's, that was part of the spirit, was that we would be changing the way people lived. Um, in the end, I think not too many people stayed. It wasn't the one that it was a Wisconsin Avenue one. Remember that? A big one. There was a, there were a few group houses. There were a lot. Yeah, a there lot. were a lot of group houses, and, uh, and and some of them were consciously communes. The ones you're talking right. about were right. very earnest. Didn't yeah. stay up all night having meetings yeah. about yeah. you know changing Sharing. the world and yeah. by changing ourselves. Right. But a lot of those houses did stay on. They became not communes but group houses. There was a certain change that a lot of people. I was one of them. A lot of people did find it comfortable to live in a group, but not necessarily a commune, yeah. a formal commune. But right. that's still the way that a lot of people live in Washington D.C. Not as much as when we were here. Young, young, young here, but um, it did seem like there was lots going on at every level in, in, in Washington. You had to choose which, what things you were going to do because you didn't have time for all of them. But you were pregnant all that first year, second no, year. No, second year. I, um, okay. Noah was born in, 70, in 71, so 71. I must have gotten pregnant right in December, the end of the year. And beginning. his middle name was what? Ben. After Madam Ben. <laughs> After Madam Ben, but... He changed it. He said, I don't like that middle name. He made it Ben. <laughs> but we Sarah, Sarah yeah. Ben is still Sarah Ben. Ah. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. Do you want to talk about the welfare rights? Oh, yes. We did a lot of work yes. with uh, yes. welfare, rights, welfare rights women. Well, at the time, we were, we were just about all white. And D.C. is... A, was then, I remember the statistic, a 76% black city. And I think we started out, but we had a demonstration at DC General Hospital around abortion because DC General had a very high um, maternal mortality rate due to illegal abortions. So I don't remember what we were Maybe we were just trying to publicize that. Maybe it was was that kind of a demonstration. But it happened that the doctors walked out the same day, right? And mm -hmm. and somehow I don't maybe you remember, but I don't exactly remember how we we formed this alliance um, with a, a welfare rights group, and we also did outrageous things with with them. I, I think see. If, I'm remembering that that um, at that time the mayor was form, had formed some kind of a committee to look at uh, mortality rates or something among children. And I think that's how we we started to get in with with the with the welfare rights group. But I do remember a meeting that was a like a fancy dinner. Oh gosh, I do remember this now. We were so. We were, we were we were bold. We it was a secret meeting, but we found out where it was. Uh, remember, we we scoped it out and, and 
again, we came in while they were having this meeting. We ran, we took all the fruit salads that were the, on the table and replaced them with peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. <laughs> Grab the microphone. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you, don't, you don't need a commission to know the kids are sick in the city, was the whole point. Why, did, why is somebody being paid to figure out that kids are sick and that there should be better health care? So that was, I don't, mm -hmm. we, and we had lots of meetings with them. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. they were an activist group, yes. the welfare rights women. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hedda Horn led yeah. it, and uh, mm -hmm. they were very, very yeah. active. And we were supporting them and all their, I think we demonstrated with them at H, what was it, human, of the federal H -E -W. agency, H-E-W? Yeah. 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 We, yeah, we we supported them in that demonstration. We had massive sit-ins yeah. at, yes. um, Finch. Uh, at, at, he was then the secretary of HEW. Yeah, mm -hmm. we would sit in his office. We yeah, I would sit in his office. There's there's newspaper. I, I, I it's yeah. included. The picture of that yeah. sit in is included in the archives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Which we've already nursing played. mothers and and what we <laughs> remember we we always brought kids to things and when it would be men would say you know what what are you get the kids out of here, we would say, we'd be happy to, where's the daycare center? <laughs> so. right. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, looking back, you should be proud of your role in the D.C. women's movement and the anti-war movement and the movement for social justice. Could you comment about your thoughts about 50 years later, looking back, um, what do you what what are your uh, thoughts about um, what was accomplished? I think that that the women's health movement accomplished a huge number of things. If you think back to when we started, um, you talked about earlier that Roger wasn't allowed into the the labor room with you when you were having Natasha. Men weren't allowed into the delivery room. Um, Women started alternative birth centers, which then were co-opted by hospitals so that they'd have one room that was really an alternative kind of light birth center. Um, this, there, there are now um, warnings about the pill. There are patient package inserts in, into pills. Abortion is legal, but who knows for how long. Um, Men get can come into the delivery rooms. All sorts of things. DS um, diethylstilbestrol was taken off the market. Um, and, um, women organized around that. It's the women's health movement that was largely responsible for um, estrogen replacement therapy being taken off the market. There we had studies long before they were acknowledged, and and the drug was actually women were warned that it, it could cause breast and uterine cancer. Um, well, I, another effect of the women's movement was that it gave a big boost to the midwifery movement. Oh, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yes. And produced things like Our Bodies Ourselves. Mm -hmm. Our Bodies Ourselves was going on. We had a, here an issue of the Quicksilver Times that was a, mm -hmm. a health issue. And our, at the same time, Our Bodies Ourselves was, was doing their thing. They were more successful. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I, have kind of, I have a question. I'm just thinking back to what we accomplished. So w there was Women's Liberation, and then there was the National Organization of Women. Ah, uh, yes. So do you have, like, can you summarize what you think? Did we give birth to National Organization of Women? Were we born at the same time, parallel I, I paths? Think, I think that... The National Organization of Women possibly preceded us, and that we formed because they weren't radical enough. So oh, well, it's partially Betty Friedan's book. Yeah, that woke everybody right. up. Right, right, and and uh, then the anti-war movement because women were so peripheral and the civil to it, rights right? yeah. movement as well. Right, so right. it was all sort of well, one thing led storm. into another. It, it, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I think that, that the women's movement probably was a direct, our part of the women's movement, a direct outgrowth of 
the anti-war movement because there was no no way for women except to be supportive. There was no yeah. really activist place for women. It was men who were being drafted, men who were burning their draft cards. It was a, a much more support and I think that women started to come together mm -hmm. and think that wait we have issues too. So yeah. Um, looking back more, when I left um, Washington I, um, and moved to San Francisco, I continued doing work with women's health. And uh, then we called it a reproductive rights movement because we said women needed to have a choice, to be able to make a choice to have or to not have a child. And that's why we had, we made it much broader than, than abortion. Mm -hmm. And that started out of the, the um, federal funding, when federal funding was taken away for uh, abortion. In California, we kept funding. We kept the funding. Med uh, Medi-Cal continued to pay. We had a lawsuit. Uh, of which the group that I was then the director of was one of the main plaintiffs. Um, and we were able to keep public funding for abortion. We still have it. Uh, right, let me explain what um, DES is. It was a drug that was given largely to white women um, because supposedly it created fatter babies. And the idea was that a fatter baby was a healthier baby. Um, but it had a very, very deleterious side effect in the daughters of the women who took the drug. A rare form of vaginal cancer, never seen, almost never seen before, uh, was, was the direct result of DES plus um, misshapen uterus, uh, T-shaped uterus, all sorts of... Uh, um, reproductive side effects and the worst part about it was that the scientists and the drug companies knew about some of these side effects and they kept selling it so women were taking it long after bad side effects were known um, so uh, the mothers started to organize uh, in in the group where I was uh, in California it was a DES mother who was the, who who was responsible for DES action um, there. It's a largely though it's the groups. I don't know if they still exist, but they were largely groups of of victims of DES. Exp off our backs. Off our backs was a newspaper um, that was formed around uh, DC well, Women's Liberation and it. Um, it came out, Norma, you worked on, off our backs. It came out weekly, monthly? I don't monthly. know. Monthly. Um, and covered all of our, everything we were doing. I mean, looking through off our backs, you would probably see the history of DC Women's Liberation. And that was our another collective. Body, our, bodies. our Bodies Ourselves is a Boston Women's Health Book Collective. It, it started out as a little pamphlet sized book and became. Year after year, that collective stayed together. I have an entire shelf full of, of off our backs as a... Our upgrade, bodies ourselves. Our, I'm sorry, our bodies ourselves as a... Every year came out with a... Not every year, but every couple of years they come out with another one. Translated into every language under the sun. They've, they've had international women's conferences. Mm -hmm. um, I, I... What did it happen without the women's movement? No, it was part of the women's movement. Yeah. It was from it came from the Boston women. Why was it so amazing? Because there were no. Uh, it was amazing, off our backs, because it addressed issues. Our bodies are so. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Start over. <laughs> Start all over. Okay. okay. Um, our bodies ourselves was revolutionary because it addressed issues that nobody else did from a woman's point of view, a woman's health point of view. Uh, it talked about things like burying the placenta in the backyard, natural childbirth, breastfeeding, periods, things that people didn't talk about, um, birth control, um, breasts, um, <laughs> it, 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 it just, uh, just from a woman's point of view. And then they, they also published one, uh, our, they published two, one, one was for kids. Do you remember the name of that book? 
I remember the book. And, and also, our, maybe that one was Ourselves Growing Older, and I know that I kept yeah. trying to get my son to read it, and both mm -hmm. of my sons, and they kept returning it to me. <laughs> we don't want this! <laughs> right. I would put it on their bed, and I would be back before I knew it. <laughs> um, they had an anniversary uh, edition yeah. recently, too. So why do you think the women's movement happened when it did in the sixth? Why do you think it emerged, and why do you think it emerged in basically urban centers, including yeah. Gainesville, Florida, New York, San Francisco? Uh, what's your analysis of that? Mm, I think the women's movement emerged when it did because women were so peripheral in the anti-war movement, but women. Who, who were in the early days of the women's movement had really come from the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement and came together as, as the women's movement. It emerged at a time when, when people still thought that we could make a revolution and that there had to be a women's voice in that revolution. It got taken to extremes, um, especially in places like D.C. Why did it emerge in, in it burst all over. It just burst out on, in the in the country. I, I remember Billy Avery in Gainesville, Florida, had an alternative birth center, and it, it was different things in different places. But it was all for women. It was all about women. Here in D.C., we had Children's House, um, and we had the office. We were more except for Children's House, more of an impact group. But other places like the Feminist Women's Health Centers actually delivered health care. Um, it, was, it, 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 it was pretty general. I mean, it, it, it was, the, I guess a, when you asked me earlier about why I it gravitated, get, gravitated towards women's health is because it felt more concrete to me, I think, than, than anything else did, except Children's House. Mm -hmm. Where almost all of our kids went. Talk about that. Well, I didn't. I was not in the group that started Children's House, but D.C. Women's Liberation had a daycare center, and it was called Children's House, and it was at the Lutheran Church in Georgetown, Georgetown on Wisconsin mm -hmm. Avenue. Mm -hmm. And as we had babies, uh, they, I guess, started about two years of age or something. They would go to Children's House, so. Mm -hmm. All of our kids. I mean, it's funny to think about now. People have to apply to nursery school. But we just, <laughs> you know, it we was just, a parent-run yeah, uh, yeah, preschool. Was, yeah. yeah, yes. And uh, we had um, alternative, alternative, an alternative preschool. Right. Yes, it was nice. It was, it was, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So there was just tons of stuff that we did. We had. Oh, we had dinners, big potluck dinners a lot. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Dancing. Yep. Parties. Yes. Dancing. Lots of dancing. Yes. Parties. Dancing. Yep. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. It was a life. I mean, it was a very, very, very full yeah, life. It was. Until it fell apart. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody have anything else? Else, do you have anything else? Uh, oh, we yeah. want to talk a little bit about the gay-straight split. Oh, okay. How, how did you experience yourself the gay-straight split in the women's movement around 1971, well, 72? Right. I, I think the gay-straight split, probably in some ways, was a direct result of our own um, theorizing about about. A, we were so angry, I think, in those early days, and it was a logical outcome to go to. Well, you're sleeping with the enemy. You shouldn't be sleeping with the enemy. <laughs> and I think I, I've always felt that what happened in in D.C. was so extreme uh, because of a couple of women who came into town who hadn't been in D.C. Women's Liberation, who identified a couple of women who I guess they thought would become gay. I don't know how they knew that because they weren't at that time. And this, and they kind of it was like a challenge of you should you should not be straight you should be gay if if you're if you're a woman in women's liberation you you have to be gay so it got to so extreme that at a certain point 
male children were not allowed into the DC Women's Liberation Office. And I was told when I was pregnant with my first child by, I think it was Sharon and Charlotte, <laughs> I remember them sitting there with me, and I said, I, I feel as though you're telling me that whether or not I can be in women's liberation is dependent on what sex child I have. Because if I have a boy, I am not going to be able to do it. And they said to me, you have a choice. You can give up the baby if it's a boy. So that was extreme. <laughs> that was extreme. Right? Yeah. Um, and, and basically, it, it, the women's movement just disintegrated after that mm -hmm. and turned into the Marxist Leninist, Leninist Mao Zedong. Right, right. Thought, thought study, study groups. That's, right. That's what we did after the That's movie. right. With men. men. With men. Right. With men. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that also was the wrong thought. Well, so that's, yeah, that's how we progressed. We, that's how we progressed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Until we all got jobs and careers. Exactly. <laughs> that we needed money. <laughs> yeah, we needed money. And right. 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 That is why I went to law yeah, school. Yeah, you went to law school. I right. got a job with the government. Yeah. And I went back to teaching. Right. And then you became an entrepreneur. Yeah. Eventually, yeah. yeah. But I looked at Phil and said, Some, we need money. Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> we have kids. Yeah. And I, I felt like I needed to make more than $10,000 a year, <laughs> which is what, because I was working for a, a women's organization in San Francisco, a women's health organization. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm going to really feel bad if I'm 50 years old and still making $10,000 a year. And that's where I was heading. So that's when I went to law school. Thank you, Alice. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. Yay.